Thank you. Okay. It was in, it was in the agenda package, but just to recap. Um, So this came from a transportation subcommittee meeting and Owen was asked to provide an update about DART service during the elections and this is his response. Um, please note that DARTs did provide service during the recent municipal election held in October of 2014, both on election day and for advanced voting day. As passengers... Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, service on election day and advanced poll voting days as passengers were able to book trips on darts going to and from voting stations due the, during the entire duration of the voting period. Please forward this information to ACPD. If you have any questions, please contact me. So, it was just general confirming that service was provided both advanced and regular polls. Any discussion on that? Yes, Patty? Uh, I guess we wouldn't know if there was any um, issues or complaints that came in. Would we? He did not report if there were or if there were not. No. Yeah. Who would know about those first? Uh, transportation or access a equity? Or, you know, yeah. DARTS is required to pass on that information to ATS, so um, I could ask. Owen, if he could provide that for the next meeting, if there are um, any complaints, is that, or no? Well, it's, it's fine for them to say that, it, you know, they did, they did it, but at what quality of service or, or what pickups were found, it'd be nice to know. And what we can do is if Lori will email Owen for that information, it'll probably come to the transportation committee meeting and then Tim could report on Okay. Sorry. Hello? Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes, I can do that and indicate to Owen that he can come through the subcommittee and then in turn go further into the sure. Any further discussion? May I have a motion to accept Owen's report? Tim? Patty? Seconded? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. So we have discussion items and update from both environment subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Is someone going to walk us through that? I, yes, I will. All right. I don't know what <laughs> This is the last meeting. Oh, right. Oh, I don't know. 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 I don't yeah. Yeah, it seems not here. Yeah, she wanted me to speak on. Um, yeah, you said like that. Can you put us about the names? Or what Terry did? No. Um, my mic doesn't work. Okay. You got to do the side. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Did yours work? Mary, did your mic work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Yeah. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it works now. Um, yeah, last Bell's environment, we had a gentleman from the city come and talk to us about side, sidewalk and road repairs, about uh, basically what's coming up, what's being done. There's a big job happening up on concession, and it's really going to tie things up big time. There are no buses. There are not going to be any buses going along concession. They're going to be moved the block back and coming up and along Sherman. And Sherman access to uh, Dravinsky Hospital is just going to be off of Sherman. You'll still be able to get to the front doors and to emergency, but there's going to be no traffic on concession at all. So that's going to really make things interesting. For how long? Um, February yeah, February till next Christmas. Yeah. yeah, it's a big project. They're doing a whole bunch of stuff, so it's gonna, it's gonna really, yeah, it's really gonna mess things up. And um, a few other little things going on. We are basically talking about why there's no urban rail at Eastgate Plaza or along Centennial. And he explained to us that it's only certain business improvement areas that are eligible to get urban rail. 
which um, we were talking about actually changing that policy because it seems absolutely ridiculous that certain hubs in very high traffic areas do not qualify for urban rail when there's a lot of traffic there. And uh, so that's another motion that uh, we're bringing up. Basically, we just talked about um, how sidewalk repair is done and how it's how it's decided. Basically, uh, we also mentioned to them that we are asking them to change the material that they use to uh, do patchwork, emergency patchwork on sidewalks because it doesn't last. He explained that they just use the asphalt because it's very cheap and it's very quick, and uh, that's the way they're going to do it. Basically. Um, we didn't get a whole lot else done. A couple, couple of things on my notes, Terry. Yeah. The cost of urban rail on that stretch of Eastgate is going to be three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Yeah, three hundred fifty thousand dollars to do urban rail in that area. It's said two or three times as expensive as regular sidewalks. Yes, that was the other point. Was that regular sidewalks? It's two point five times as expensive for regular sidewalks yeah. to put in urban. And he also said there, given the current funding that the department has, they're about 10 years behind and will continue to 10 years behind. Yeah. Yeah. And that's absolutely ridiculous. That's the situation. He also, yeah. So just to clarify, when you talk about urban rail, you're talking about the marks at the corners, right? Urban rail, no, the whole the sidewalk. Kind of when you've got the dark bands along the sides and the whole, all, all of urban rail. And is it just along the edge of the sidewalk or the whole sidewalk? No, the way the whole the whole sidewalks are done, you've got the edging going along that's in that's dark color, right? Contrast colors, and the uh, it's uh, textured as well. And then, yeah, everything that happens at the corners and the uh, names being in and the, the, whole, the whole thing, the whole urban rail. Yes, Tim? My, my recollection is on that piece. We also needed to go back and look at the urban rail design guidelines that the city has to ensure that they are compliant or exceed AODA requirements, if I recall correctly. We actually, at that meeting, I, I don't think you were there, Tim, last meeting. We actually asked to get hold of the policy so we can read it over and review it. That's good. So, so that, <coughs> excuse me, no, that was a consideration. Plus, if I recall correctly, it wasn't just past me, but I think it was two meetings ago. The representative from, from the city's um, public works or wherever he was from said that, that half, of, half of Centennial Parkway was done, but half was not. And we talked about possibly trying to get the urban rail on the on the stretch between Queenston Road and King Street. I think, yeah. Yeah. if I recall correctly, and I don't know if that was ever um, if there was ever an answer to that question. Yeah, they they said no. They said that that's not that doesn't qualify for urban rail. That they're only putting it in certain areas, and also it was the cost that was prohibitive there too. So, Tom, so Patty. it's okay. That's fine. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Well, it, it's just further to what Terry was just saying. Uh, it seems to me that the, the issue about the urban braille was it was to be installed only in business improvement areas, and that was part of the city's master plan or something along that. Yeah. And I think Maxine was going to go back and actually get a copy of that master plan to review so that we could make a specific recommendation to council about that master plan being amended? Yeah. So was that actually followed it. up? Yeah. Maxine yes, gave it to me at uh, our last meeting. So are, are we to make a motion for council to amend the city's master plan so that Urban Braille can be installed everywhere as opposed to just in BIAs? Would that motion come through the committee to us? Or would we make the motion here? Patty, go ahead and talk about this again. Yeah, um, at our last meeting, um, Maxine gave me um, our, the urban braille system as it stands today and the policies. Um, and it's quite the read and it's quite upsetting. And I think we've got a lot of issues to deal with and um, at, at, at BUILT. 
Um, but uh, the new urban braille um, policies that they're going by um, was approved by council. And with all the reading, like there's, a, there's so much in here that it, it just blows my mind. And how, how I got upset with everything was um, when, when they were talking about doing, they're putting urban braille from, I don't know if you know, old downtown Stony Creek, but from Battlefield Park, way out past the attic, uh, Apple, and not at Eastgate Square. And when I asked why, and who makes that decision, um, we, we didn't get no answers. So that's why I needed to do a lot of reading. And um, Maxine was supposed to get me the numbers on uh, the disabled, whether they're visually impaired or mobility, uh, et cetera, around Eastgate Square, where the need is there. That's where the, the bus hub is there at Eastgate Square and everything. And so we, we have a lot of work to do on this issue. And uh, in the readings in here, what one thing that upset me was um, their dealings with CNIB. And CNIB uh, has, it seemed like they were working alone with CNIB. And CNIB uh, told them that uh, urban braille is not necessary <laughs> in certain areas. As long as there's grass on both sides, they don't need urban braille. And I'm like, because they can tell the distinction between the sidewalk and the grass. That was upsetting, so I think we have a lot of work to do on this. And urban braille is not just about the uh, distinction on the sides. You know, there's a lot more to urban braille and the pathway keeping it clear. Um, I'm not sure if it's two different uh, uh, things, urban braille and the pathways where, you know, nothing is to be in the line of travel on a sidewalk. Is that, if that's under the new urban braille through the ODA information. So, but. Yeah, so there's a lot of work to do with it. Um, and th there's a lot of stuff. I made a lot of notes in here. Um, but I think we'll, we'll deal more with it at built and um, you know, try and get some action going on it. Because I, I do believe that they're just, uh, like who, who, who gets to choose where Urban Braille will be? It's supposed to be in the BIA, so that was a decision. And Eastgate Square and all of this not part of the BIA, no. Yeah, so. So it sounds a bit like council has to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. yeah. Tim, you had your hand up. So just a couple of points based upon what Patty has said. A, I think we need to invite CNIB here to this committee and I'll be prepared to make a motion around that because CNIB is thinking about accessibility from one perspective and one perspective only. Very free design guidelines for pedestrian pathways was based upon a number of factors of which blind and visually impaired pedestrian pathways was only one small component of that of that purpose. Mm -hmm. So so if, if city staff are, are relying on CNIB alone to make that recommendation, they have missed the boat big time. So I think we need to address that with, with city staff in a very uh, conservative way. Secondly, um, it would be a big concern for me that city council has already endorsed a policy that is uh, uh, contrary to AODA requirements around pedestrian pathways. And my concern is that the city of Hamilton right now is actually violating the law. So regardless of whether the city in their own policy around master plan has pedestrian, accessible pedestrian pathways and BIAs only, the law doesn't talk about BIAs only. It talks about pedestrian pathways everywhere. So, um, you know, I think I think we need to perhaps put a motion or put a statement forward to council in some way to let them know that in fact they've got construction work going on right now and planned for the future that in, in the opinion of ACPD 
is contrary to the AODA regulations, which puts the city at risk of, of actually having to go back and 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 redo all that work again should should a complaint come forward. So I, I think council needs to hear that clearly, and then maybe in the meantime we can be doing our our due diligence and our homework around uh, looking at the pedestrian pathway design guidelines to see whether or not they're consistent with AODA and to look at the master plan and make a, a more specific recommendation to council on what they should do. But in the meantime, I think we should get CNIB here and have conversation with them. And I think we need to get information to city staff that they cannot be relying upon CNIB for opinion. They need to come here to this table. And the, set, and the third thing is I think we need to put council on, on notice. I think that would be a, a good approach. Right. Yes. So, Tim, your motion is? Bring CNIB. I just jotted it down. <laughs> if everyone's okay, Tim, and any the seconder, that the committee clerk be directed to invite representatives from the CNIB to a future ACPD meeting to discuss the issue of the use of urban braille. Do you want in the city of Hamilton or just leave it generic? I think it's implied, so it's I'm, implied. I'm fine with it. You're okay? It. Sure. Could, could planning also be at that meeting so that okay. we can hear both sides there? So should the motion include that? Tim, does your motion include that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> what, what more he says? <laughs> <laughs> planning or public works, I'll get the right department. Okay. For sure. Brian, did you have your hand up? Uh, well, I mean, maybe it's a different issue. Um, I just think that the, the, the problem is, is the city doesn't want to dump a, a, a truckload of money all of a sudden and say we're going to put $100, billion, you know, $100 million into urban braille right now. But they, so should, be able, but they should be able to come Brian, up with some... Um, oh. If you don't mind, hold that thought. Okay, sure. What I'm going to do is finish this motion. Okay, sure. And then we'll, because okay. that's kind of like discussion, right? Yeah. So may I have a second to motion, Terry? Thank you. Um, no. Now, yes? Um, is this what, a discussion? Yeah, let me just... Um, Paul McChain is the one that we've been Paul working McChain. with. Okay. Um, just for one sake. Sure. All right. So, any discussion on this motion? Specific to the motion, Brian. If it isn't, I'll come back to you. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, maybe come back to me, sort of a... I will. All right. Any further discussion on the motion itself? No? All in favor? Aye. All right. Carrie, thank you. All right, Brian and Patty, and then we have to come back to Terry to finish the report. So, oh, that was on. Okay, um, so it, we always run into this situation where, you know, as Tim points out, the city is not compliant with AODA, right? It's just that we're going to have we're going to have in these particular BIA areas. We're not going to have urban braille and uh, everywhere. So what we have to tell the city through a motion or whatever is that you have to at least come up with a plan. So um, we we understand that you can't spend maybe a hundred million dollars right right this year to to bring everything up to urban braille everywhere at once. You just, you just don't, it's not feasible for you to have that kind of money available. However, it is feasible that you have a plan. So we should demand that the, that the city come up with a plan that over the next, you know, uh, period of time, whatever, that they have a plan that year by year they're going to they're gonna, um, bring the whole city up to urban braille. And so that's what we should have a motion too, I think, as well, is that um, we want to see a plan from the city that, that they're going to bring the whole city up to urban braille standards under as of like as as, as required under AODA, um, um, you know, and, and certainly by 2025 or whatever the whatever the time period is. I think that's a great idea, but first, I think the committee has to decide look at the policies, ask all those questions, mm -hmm. and then I think perhaps they might bring that motion to us. Yeah. But I think they should think about that. Patty, and then Tim, and then back to Terry. Yeah, I just want to read one little thing here. Um, and this is the policies from uh, Planning and Economic Development Department, Planning Division. And 
their new urban Hamilton official plan was council approved. The following policies, among others, of the council approved urban Hamilton official plan are applicable to the subject report. Places that are safe, accessible, connected, and easy to navigate shall be created by using the following design applications where appropriate, including urban braille components and streetscape improvements. And then uh, they give codes, I don't know what those mean. Um, the streets shall be designed not only as a transportation network, but also as important public spaces and shall include, where appropriate, pedestrian amen amenities such as lighting, seating, wayfinding, signage, and urban braille. Interesting, Interesting yeah. yeah. Tim? So I'm just trying to formulate in, on paper here something that I think we need to say to council. Um, and I haven't quite finished it, but I'll, I'll start it anyway, and then... Do you want us to come back to Terry's report? Um, yeah, maybe we could, and then... then Because sure. it, it deals with this whole urban braille design side of the stuff. So that was, uh, that was basically it. That took off most of the meeting. I mean, actually, that took almost all of the meeting. The other, the other things that he touched on... Um, where the uh, the angles of sidewalks, there are a few sidewalks, it's uh, because of drainage considerations, sidewalks do have to be on a slight angle. Um, a lot of the older sidewalks, like the ones I pointed out to them on Market Street, are on a very steep angle to the point that you can only wheel with one hand to keep yourself from going veering off into the road. He said, new sidewalks, I think it's supposed to be nothing more than a 2% angle, but the, the old ones that are only uh, sidewalks that are only 4 to 5 feet wide, that's just the way they are and there's not much can be done about it. Um, just trying to remember the last thing that we talked about. Oh. oh yeah, um, inserts. It, we were showing at the meeting before, um, these yellow um, metal inserts that are going to be put at intersections. Um, they're almost like manhole covers. They've got little raised, little raised bumps on them, basically to let people with low vision know that they're coming to the road, that they're coming to an intersection. And we looked at them, we had three or four different styles made out of different materials. Uh, I mean, some were plastic, some were metal. There were different ones. There's already some installed in front of the GO station at, uh, on Hunter Street, Street Hunter and Houston. Um, and he encouraged people to check those out if they never had. But he was just basically looking for our opinion on what we thought was appropriate, what we thought about them being used. And I think there was sort of a general consensus on the committee that they're really not a good idea. There's too many problems. Um, there's problems with snow removal, there's problems with, with ice, with them being iced over, there's problems with tripping hazards. There, there were a lot of problems that we felt, and I think we, we pretty much decided that good urban braille is good enough for, you know, we need another design. Those designs really weren't all that great. And that was about it, we ended up that took the whole meeting, so we we didn't only really do anything else. We didn't cover anything else. Okay. Before we accept the report, I guess we should hear what Tim has yeah. to say. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looked to perhaps Lori to provide some guidance whether we should make a statement to council in the form of a motion or whether we should just be able to make a statement. But <coughs> first off, and and. In any kind of statement, I think it's important that we go back to uh, a motion that had been sent to council some years ago, where this committee recommended to council that urban braille be installed in all new sidewalk construction. And I'd love to tell you I know exactly when that motion was taken, um, but I but I do know it's on the book somewhere. Okay, we're right here in their it's right in their policy about that. That this committee made that recommendation, yeah. but they didn't adopt that policy. No. Or they didn't adopt it, so maybe that maybe that 
that uh, master plan will provide some guidance in terms of when. But that's something this committee made a motion. So I would be, I would be, again, whether that we put this in the form of a motion to council or we put it in the form of a statement. First off, I'd like to bring to council's attention that this committee on such and such a date took a motion and recommending the council uh, 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 ensure that urban rail design guidelines are part of all sidewalk designs of every single sidewalk construction in this city. Second, second part of that um, message to council is that um, the city does have its own urban braille design guidelines, which, which fundamentally was the leading set of guidelines used by many municipalities in this province and across this country. Hamilton was the first city to actually develop and adopt a set of pedestrian pathway um, guidelines. And they've been the basis of many other municipalities' own guidelines adoptions. Um, the third point I would make is that um, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act has in its regulations um, the requirement that all pedestrian pathways be accessible at the very least within the AODA requirements. Um, the fourth statement I would make is the city is at this moment moving forward to install sidewalk, new sidewalk construction that is not compliant with either the city's own guidelines or the AODA. So they are in fact contravention of, their, of the law as well as their own guidelines. The fifth statement I would make is that the city's master plan while making mention of pedestrian pathways, as approved by City Council, has endorsed the notion that pedestrian pathways would be accessible in only BIA areas, business improvement areas, which is problematic because they, there's an automated, an automatic assumption that blind or visually impaired or persons with disabilities travel only in BIAs. <laughs> How they get to the BIA without a problem is beyond my comprehension, but the fact is they travel only in BIAs. And the last statement I would be making to Council is that, that this committee actually recommends that Council go back and review their master plan, review their own guidelines, their pedestrian pathway guidelines, and the AODA, and the AODA pedestrian pathway regulations to ensure that all future construction, current and future construction, is compliant with one or the other. So if that makes any sense to folks, that's what I would be proposing. Um, Mary, I see your hand. And my question would be, should that motion go today from us, or should it come from the committee after they've looked at all the the information that they're gathering. Well, I'll let committee decide on that. Mary, you had your hand up. I have brought up at the Seniors Advisory Committee the pedestrian mobility plan that was passed last December. All of this sort of ties in with it, and I think uh, it's important that this committee also read it because um, to make an age-friendly city, they're supposed to be trying to make it as safe as possible for people to be out there. Uh, all of these reports are in sort of silos and need to be brought together when we do our homework. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it sounds like um, that, like what Patty was saying, um, as that you know, there's a lot of things we have to do, and we have to do we have to do our homework, so to speak. And then I think assemble it all together. Uh, and also we want to listen to CNIB and the city planners and that type of thing. Once we get it all assembled, then we, we can make a proposal. I just want to emphasize that the one thing is that what we can what we should we should be able to accept is that they've come up with a plan. You know, that that, they, that every year they're gonna be, you know, like Kim says when they do new construction. But 
even beyond that, they should have a plan that every year they're allocating resources to bring the standards up to urban braille. Whether they're doing new sidewalks or whether they're not doing sidewalks, every year they're, they're, they've got some kind of plan going. It's just like we did with the, with the uh, um, you know, crossing, crossing at intersections, you know, and you say, they say, we're going to spend this much a year, and we're going to just keep spending and spending and spending until, they're, until it's done. And I think we have to do that with the sidewalks and urban braille is, sure, there should be new construction, should be compliant and all that, but they should be spending every year, and they should have a plan that, that, that indicates that. What is in their plan and what uh, is, is planned for urban braille is downtown Dundas, downtown Stony Creek, Ancaster Village Core, and downtown Waterdale. That's what's in the plan. That's it. Living in Ancaster, <laughs> I can tell you that there aren't a lot of people on Ancaster sidewalks. <laughs> no. It's it's <laughs> but uh, to help Tim uh, with, with uh, what, what's going on and what I'm concerned about, I just want to read this one little part, if that's okay. The draft urban bra braille design and implementation manual has been created but not finalized due to the release of the Government of Ontario's uh, draft built environment standards, which creates potential design conflicts to the ultimate urban brand braille standards. Right? So it says uh, the manual will be brought forward to Council for approval once um, built standards. There's conflict. I guess conflicts in the designs. Yep. So that's what they're going by. So I don't know what's happening there. You and many others. Tim, you had your hand up. Um, actually, that's an incorrect statement because the urban braille design guidelines were adopted by the city of Hamilton back in the 90s. Yeah, 2009. So, so, so you know, no, well, that, in, the 90s. in the 1990s, they were they were developed and designed, and, and and the guidelines were actually in place in the 1990s. So, so this this comment in this master plan yeah, statement, it's a that standard, they, right, is is fundamentally incorrect. I do agree with the point that the AODA requirements are going to come into play, and they need to be reviewed in the context of the two together. I, I, I absolutely agree with that, but at the end of the day, they have to do one or the other. Either our guidelines, which were adopted previously to the AODA, exceed the AODA, and therefore they should be operating on the AODA, or on the city's guidelines, or the AODA guidelines exceed, and current construction has to comply with the AODA guidelines, and then you know, they go back and review the city's own guidelines to bring them up to speed. Like, those are the those are the options. So, um, you know, and I, I, I appreciate the fact that, Patty, you're doing all this work, but fundamentally, this isn't your job. This is a city staff job. And, and our job is to perhaps understand and know what those various regulations say and to bring it to the attention of the city, but it's not our job to actually do the work of a city staff person. This is what they're, that's what they're paid to do. So I, I, I appreciate and, and absolutely respect you for what you're doing, but, but I think we need to use your expertise to bring to the attention of City Council the fact that they are falling behind, they're not doing their job. And, and I think that's our role. Well, and I, think what I don't think we doing. should be the ones actually going back and, and redeveloping the guidelines. We may be advisors to the de guideline development, but I don't think we should be initiating that's a city, that's but a I think job. you have to understand what the city has done in order to make the recommendations. Agreed. But I've got to come back to you, Tim. Are you going to make a motion with that, and then the committee can decide <coughs> what to do with it? Well, I guess my question for Lori is, you know, is it to sort of bring a statement to council and put them on notice, or should we actually be putting it in a motion? I mean, I, I appreciate that there's other stuff that, that may have to go on that will come afterwards um, in terms of more inquiry and understanding the, the potential um, compatibility or conflict between AODA and city pedestrian pathway guidelines and stuff like that. But 
you know, should we just simply put them on notice, or do, should we actually put it in a, in a motion? Um, I would suggest doing a motion. It carries a bit more weight, and it is an, an action item that ac they can direct that action be taken at. Um, what I'd suggest is perhaps you could take it back to Built Environment Subcommittee, and I know you guys are going to research it further, but in the interim, come up with just something like you said, that uh, a synopsis of your three or four points, um, and then as more information becomes available, you can um, change the motion or make a new motion then. So um, since it is a bit more complicated, it might be hard to bring from the floor today, but if you brought it forward between the two of us, we could work on it for January or back to build environment for January. So um, I think a motion would be strong. Too. I'm okay to bring it back. You're okay to bring it back? Sure, sure. You, maybe uh, I did write down what you have and over the next uh, week or two we can uh, work on it and refine it a bit and either then at that time if you want to bring it back to the subcommittee or just here in January then we can go from there. So. Is the subcommittee meeting before our next Sure. Yeah, we'll meet in January. When, when, uh, the first Tuesday in January, I'm not sure what the date is. Oh, that's awesome. Perfect timing. Okay. So. Do you want to keep that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I need a motion to accept the built environment uh, report. Patty had her hand up first, seconded by Brian. Yep. All in, oh, any other discussion? All in favor? I've got to see more eyes to see. Okay, no. <laughs> all, right. all right. Carrie, thank you. All right, before we go to the next section, now that everyone is here, can we just go around the table and introduce ourselves? I'm Asna Mallet. I'm Sue Daly. Tatiana Omanovic from uh, Access and Equity Department, so Compliance and Regulation Specialist with Kim Maxine. Tom Anthony. Tim Murphy. Patty Cameron. Bob Semko. Mary Semko. Paul Tolson. Terry Wallace. <coughs> Christopher Cutler and I'm with the Office of the Mayor. Will you be the rep now? I will be. Awesome. Oh, good, good. You, you, you were with the H uh, Conservation Authority? Were you? No, no. What's my time? Yeah. Oh, he's a good guy. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Elvis Presley. Yes, no. <laughs> I'm Brian Lake. <laughs> 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 Tim Nolan. <Noah. laughs> Yeah, you were good. I remember that. And Lori, the Duke Clerk's office. All right, thank you. All right, update from the Transportation Subcommittee. Do we have any updates? Um, there was no update on the agenda, but you're really taxing my memory if I'm trying to go back to what we did two weeks ago. Um, I, I think, I can't remember what I did this morning, but it two weeks ago. Um, I think there was a motion, and actually, it's on the front side of the paper I just gave over to Terry. So I guess we'll have to deal with that one. Oh, um, yeah. But that's okay. I, I, you go ahead. I think we can probably get Lori to read it. Right? Um, the primary uh, work of the subcommittee uh, discussion at the last meeting was the review of HSR policies. There was a fair bit of discussion around that sort of re rejigging them to some degree. Um, we've, we've looked at the fact that um, transportation in the city goes far beyond just simply what DARTS provides or what taxis might provide through taxi script and we have to start looking at HSR more comprehensively so there's a fair bit of discussion about HSR policies and that'll go on for probably a little while yet. Um, the second thing that generated a fair bit of conversation and this is um, uh, the culmination of, of which uh, is in today's motion deals with the uh, um, eligibility for service and what professionals are eligible to um, sign off on on um, medical forms, excuse me, or the documentation that a person with a disability would submit uh, in consideration for eligibility. And so that motion is is before us today. 
So I think those are, are primarily the things I would look to. Any others who uh, uh, are part of the transportation committee to fill in any gaps I might have missed. Again, this was generated at the Transportation Subcommittee. That a subcommittee of the ACPD be formed for the purpose of reviewing the list of medical professionals who are authorized to complete application forms for accessible transportation services. So just for your information on that motion, uh, and I will make the motion, we need a, obviously a seconder. Um, the subcommittee did did ask that, that some folks be part of that, and I, again, I'd love to folks to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Mary, Terry, Paula, and, and Kim Tom. from the yeah. subcommittee. Right? Those and are the Tom four? Well. Well, no, Tom's not, Tom, 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 Tom is not a part of the transportation subcommittee. So from the subcommittee itself was Mary, Terry, Paula and Kim, I think those are the four. We had asked to invite Tom yeah, to yeah, be no. as part of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why the motion is, is here. Um, uh, part of the reason why the motion is here anyway. We also recommended uh, three representatives from McMaster, um, somebody from the uh, Department of Rehabilitation Science, somebody mm -hmm. from the Department of Social Work, and somebody from the Department of Ger of well, I was about to say gerontology, but it's aging, health, and society. I think that's the actual name. Simply because we're, you know, we wanted to be not just uh, committee members, but but also getting opinion from from experts in the uh, community. So, um, and we wanted to see if there's anybody else here who have in, who may have interest in sitting on that. But I think that would be secondary to the actual motion itself. So, and of course, Tom, your name came up because of your, your uh, um, professional background. So, I think we need to deal with the motion and then, and then determine the members. Go ahead, Tom. May I speak to the motion? <coughs> uh, um, I have an issue with the phrasing of the motion as opposed to medical and perhaps health care professionals. Uh, replace the term medical. Health care professionals? Yes. yes. Tim, were you, uh, I missed part of what you were saying. So are you looking at expanding the whole committee? What we talked about at the subcommittee was to have the four representatives from the subcommittee put the question here to the bigger committee if there was anybody interested with the specific, as Terry said, specific mention was made possibly of Tom because of his professional background. But the original motion, I'm pretty sure the original motion at the subcommittee, um, um, or at least the discussion was, we would also go back and ask for, um, invite representatives from those various departments at McMaster University to also participate, and then bring forward a recommendation, obviously, to the big committee or to the transportation subcommittee for any changes to the qualified personnel who can who can sign off on behalf of persons with disabilities in the eligibility application. Well, I'm wondering about, uh, I had, through my family, had contact with, uh, I guess it's St. It Peter's there, um, and a Dr. Wu, who was specializing in gerontology and aging and all that type of thing at St. Peter's. <coughs> She seemed to be quite knowledgeable and had students from Mac that would train under her to to have training with seniors. So I just wondered about contacting Dr. Wu at St. Peter's if she would if she would be interested or someone from from that from that hospital would be interested. But she was she's quite a nice person and she's really uh, keen about about gerontology and aging and all that type of thing. So I thought she'd be good. And I don't know what to say about that because it sounds like committee's already got a plan and they're presenting it to us. So the committee wants to reconsider. Um, well, just like that, would be, they, they could add that if they wanted to. Um. Okay. And Patty? Um, I'm just a little, uh, I'm not sure what what's going on. Um, the, per the purpose of this committee 
is just to review the list of uh, professionals who are going to be authorized. Can you speak some more about that? Like, what is what is this group going to be doing? Just reviewing the professionals that will be part of the transportation? No, sorry, Tim. So what the catalyst for this discussion was um, brought forward by Mary, <clears throat> primarily because chiropractors are not on the list of qualified practitioners who can sign off on the eligibility forms. So that led to a bit of a broader discussion about who should be qualified to sign off on the forms, yeah. whether we were just simply going to add chiropractors to the list and be done with it. Um, part of the concern in the discussion was that under the current revisions of the AODA customer service guidelines, um, the definition of qualified practitioners is very broad such that you could fundamentally have a dental hygienist sign off on a person's requirement to have a service animal be present with them wherever they go. Wow. And so, you know, the disability community at large uh, has some concerns, best as I understand. So I, I think we need to take a bit more of a comprehensive look at the qualified practitioners who can sign off. And as part of that discussion, we, we talked about, do we simply want to operate under a medical construct of disability such that we would only allow the medical personnel, sorry Tom, healthcare personnel medical to sign off. So, you know, and if the answer to that question is yes, then who then qualifies? Does a dental hygienist qualify to sign off? I would think when we talk about eligibility for accessible transportation services, dental hygienists probably wouldn't be on that list. But that's me making my own personal interpretation and assumption of who would or who would not be qualified. So that also then led to a bit of a broader discussion. Do we want to think about qualified personnel? Because, you know, maybe as, as for example, one, one specific category that's mentioned there is a recreational specialist. So that takes you a bit, a bit outside of the, the context of the medical model of disability and puts you into that more social model. So, you know, should we be starting to think about that social model in a bit more of a broader context. And in order to help us do that, it was determined that maybe some representatives from the educational sector, such as social work, gerontologists, and, and rehabilitation specialists, might help us to understand that, that difference between the social and the medical models in a bit more of a broader discussion. So that's more or less, I think, where we came from. I, again, I would certainly invite Mary or Terry to, to and, and Bob, I think that's it, right? Mary, Terry, and Bob, mm -hmm. to perhaps jump in here and add, add some of their own comments or, or interpretations of that discussion. All right. Any comments? Mary? If you can remember last spring, HSR buses were not allowed to go to the front of the McMaster Hospital anymore, but darts could. We were looking further at the Hamilton Health Sciences building and they all have a very long, and sometimes cases, steep walk from an HSR stop to the front door. In that respect, many people who go for consultation appointments at the various hospitals are uh, put at risk because they have to walk so far and we were recommending that they get conditional eligibility for darts to get them to those appointments. That's where who would sign the application forms came up. In the terms of chiropractors, they're allowed to sign for 
uh, disability benefits for government and provincial uh, uh, benefits. So that why should they be excluded when it comes to something as fundamental as somebody trying to maintain their independence in the community? If I could ask a question, Tim, regardless of who makes assigns that paper, doesn't ATS do their own evaluation afterwards? I'm, I'm not sure to what degree ATS is doing their own evaluations. I, I do believe that, that where they disagree with the application, there's a process in place that they have to go back and view it if that denial is appealed. <clears throat> but I think fundamentally they're only going out to the community to, to review um, more for uh, determining whether persons can travel all of the time on darts or just some of the time on darts. And you know, I think it's a very good question to ask who's actually qualified to say whether or not a passenger or a potential passenger needs to uh, access darts all of the time or some of the time. And uh, you know there may be some people who are better capable of doing that than others. So it, it probably just warrants a whole review of who, who is, is going to be entitled to sign off on these forms. Okay. Um, I just have a question about, I, I'm, always, I'm always scared about when you have certain get to do stuff because I, I, I see the picture of fees, right? I, I have the picture of people with disabilities. A lot of them are, you know, basically poverty stricken or whatever. And then if someone says, hey, I get to do this, but no, no other people don't get to sign these forms or fill these forms, then I can charge a fee, you know, and I'm going to charge a fee and the next year I'm going to raise that fee. And, <laughs> and, and then you get people that are, you know, trying to even have enough for heat or have enough for food monthly and then someone says oh that's a two hundred dollar fee if you want to apply for this or whatever right they just state it so that's what that's what scares me is not so much who's authorized to do it I'm more fr sort of frightened about um, the people that are authorized starting to set fees and all this kind of stuff that scares me Terry well it's it's up to doc doctors to decide whether or not they charge fees for filling out forms. Like, it's up to your, if you go to your family doctor, it's up to them whether or not they charge or, what, or not for their time. It's up to individual specialists, I would say, to decide whether they charge for filling out a form or not. It's not really. Yeah, they just don't want them to charge too much, right? Because people just say, I can't apply because I... I don't have the money for it. Um, what is the procedure or how it's been in the past for uh, getting an application for uh, ATS? Like, are they signed by doctors or what, what do they present to become a member of DARTS? Uh, Tim, are OTs and physios allowed to sign? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't remember everybody who was on the list, but I think it was doctors, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, recreational specialists. Um, nurse practitioners? They nurse even said registered there. nurses. There was a list of only about five or six potential professionals. Mm -hmm. The list was actually quite short. We asked someone to go back and take a look at other jurisdictions, and, and I'm not sure that there was any miracle uh, list to draw from because they seem to be all over the map. Okay. So uh, I think the ultimate, the reason this has come forward is we believe that, that, that a review is required and to simply add a chiropractor to the list was perhaps an incomplete process because you know we could put chiropractors on the list today, but, you know, then somebody else is going to come forward with a recommendation next week and a week after, and a week after, and a week after. And we're always just going to be doing a one-off on the list. And I think ultimately the, the, the determination was we need to look at this um, more systemically, make a determination about what systemic approach do we want to take, 
once we understand that, we know who should be on the list, and then be done with it. Okay, so I'm assuming that committee is going to report back to us. Is there anyone who wasn't mentioned on that, for being on that subcommittee, that wants to be involved? I think that was your question, right, Tony? First off, I'd suggest we just deal with the motion okay. uh, in terms of do we agree or disagree, and then if we get agreement, then we can, uh, in a second motion or just a, an outcome, determine membership. Could you repeat the motion? Sure, I can do that. That a subcommittee of ACPD be formed for the purpose of reviewing the list of healthcare professionals who are authorized to complete application forms for accessible transportation services. Okay, so moved move by Tim, am I correct? Seconded by Terry. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Good, carried, thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna interrupt, you. Madam Chair. Did you wanna name these subcommittee members as a part B to that motion? Or like so, formally, or just, just have it as I, I, I prefer formally, simply yeah. because okay. The subcommittee assumed that Tom would want to be there, but I don't think anybody's actually asked Tom if he wants to be there. So um, uh, you know, maybe Tom doesn't want to be there. I don't know. So um, the four subcommittee members who put forward their names were, again, I'm happy to be corrected. I think it was Terry, Mary, um, Paula, and Kim. Um, those four people did put forward their names and said, yes, I want to be part of this. Um, we did recommend that we go after those three departmental representatives from McMaster. Um, Brian is certainly suggesting somebody from St. Peter's, whether it be this Dr. Wu or perhaps a colleague of Dr. Wu, I don't know. Um, personally, I'm not, I'm not married to one or the other, so um, and I think it's fair to ask Tom if he has interest, and if he is, then he can put forward his name. Tom. Are you interested? I'm, I'm happy to contribute, but just if I may what, say one word, not speaking for my profession, but speaking as with my members had on here as an advocate for persons with disability. Uh, we want to make sure we don't limit the gatekeepers to persons with accessibility because then we, um, we're, we're limited, we're going against our mandate or, or our mission statement and that we want to make everything accessible. However, we do need to have this discussion. The limiting of gatekeepers uh, uh, to three or four professions uh, is an issue with me. If you'd want me, I'm happy to participate, given that statement. And Tim, did you ask if you wanted others to express an interest? Again, I, you know, if there's others who have interest, I would say, personally, put your name out there. But okay. um, again, I come back to committee. Are we in agreement that, that fundamentally we want to go after representatives from McMaster and possibly St. Peter's? Does that seem like a reasonable process? And do we need to actually state the members and, and the desire of external professionals as part of a motion? So I look to Lori to answer that question. I think just naming the uh, members from this group and Mary, who will be joining us fine and leaving it in generic terms for the committee to determine who exactly at MAC and or St. Peter's. That can be, it doesn't have to be formalized, we can just leave that in a generic way. So now we need a motion to accept the transportation committee report. Brian moves, seconded by Bob. Um, all in favor? Which Bob? Bob. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, now we go to Amalgamated Transit Union. Um, I, have to speak. Yeah, I was just going to say, you're going to look into that and you're going to talk to us. Yeah, uh, there were three or four different groups that the committee indicated at the last meeting they'd like to hear from. And one of them was a, a rep from the Amalgamated Transit Union. Uh, the issue came up about it being a possible conflict um, in terms of what the previous director of the HSR had, had advised committee regarding city employee versus union rep versus management and staff. And 
So in order to um, address that and make sure we were proceeding okay, I talked to the deputy clerk and she suggested that the committee um, pass a motion to ask for an ATU, that's the Amalgamated Transit Union, to pass a motion to ask for them to come so that there is, isn't that sense of should they come, shouldn't they, um, is this correct or not. So if we have it in writing that that's your desire to have them to come, and that was to speak about the issue of securing passengers um, with mobility devices on, on buses. So um, Mary, when she was still here, recommended that you guys pass a motion on that just to just to protect everybody involved, both staff and management. All right. So how would you like to proceed? Um, yes, Terry. Um, the uh, the uh, union rep for that union um, is a gentleman named Eric, Eric Tuck. He's, uh, he's a bus driver and he's also part of that union. I've spoken to him a few times and he's actually asked to come and speak to the committee. So if we pass this motion, we know that we're not going to have any trouble getting them to come. Can the motion be specific with the name? Yes, I can add that. Okay. Sure. So do we have a motion? Lori? Um, I think I wrote a little something up before, but something to the effect um, that there you go here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, that the committee on, that the committee clerk be directed to contact Mr. Eric Tuck, President, Hamilton Local Amalgamated Transit Union, to invite him to attend a future meeting of the ACPD to discuss the role of the H of HSR drivers in securing passengers who use mobility devices. And I, I don't know if you want it limited to that. That was, I know, your primary concern, but that doesn't mean he can't mm -hmm. talk about other issues. But this formalizes it and kind of might uh, make management a bit happier um, that um, you guys are asking him. Terry, is this your motion? Yeah. Terry? Did you want to change it in any way? No, I have this one. Okay. So Terry has moved that for a second. Um, um, any further discussion? Oops, you lost your little microphone. There you go. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Um, I, I'm not so sure it's a good idea to get him to come to ACPD. Um, this originated with the Transportation Subcommittee. I'm not sure why it's not coming out of the Transportation Subcommittee as a motion. Um, we've got a new director. Uh, of transit for the city, and I'm not sure it's politically savvy to ask ATU to come to the committee bypassing the new director. The new director has been asked to come to the transportation subcommittee meeting for January. I, I think it's I think it's fair and politically savvy to have that discussion at the transportation subcommittee with him first, um, and then and then should he be. Um, happy and all for it and, and so on. I think uh, then we would proceed on that basis. But I'm not, I'm not sure that, that um, we have fully discussed um, all of the issues around passenger travel on HSR buses adequately. And I'm not sure uh, the new director has had a fair chance to understand the issues and to try to address them with the members of of the transit union. I'm not opposed to having a conversation with a representative of the transit union. In fact, I actually raised that with Don Hall personally when he was uh, still director. But um, for us to, to move ahead and do this without having consultation with the new director, I'm not sure that's the right, right way to go about our business. Tim, are you suggesting that we ask the new director or just chat with the new director? Or are you asking the new director to be here at the same time? Actually, if I could intervene, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the other uh, individuals that the committee asked me to invite was the new uh, director, um, Mr. Dixon. And he has agreed to come for January, so he will okay. be here. So if Mr. Tuck's coming, probably don't want it to be January, but <laughs> um, uh, he is uh, scheduled to, to attend this year. Is he coming to ACPD? Or to yes, to ACPD. Okay. Yes. So. So I, I, again, I'm not I'm not opposed to the idea in principle. Okay. 
I, I just think we need to be more strategic about our approach. Um, and I think the new director needs to know that, that that's going to happen. And I think, in fairness to him, he needs to be able to speak to that matter. So um, he's, he's coming to the transportation subcommittee. And if I, you know, if we look I'm to uh, 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 Dixon is coming to the transportation subcommittee David in January. Dixon. Okay, so, it's so you know, I, you know, I'm not sure why you know these people are coming to the big committee when they haven't come to the small committee first. One of the we, reasons we look maybe, at Tim that we've discussed this, like this whole committee has talked about the issues around the operators, but fine, fair enough. I don't, I don't have a problem with that that's in principle. Just my but assumption, right? yeah, no, fine, fair enough. I don't have a problem with that in principle. But if we adopt practice and standard practice. We don't invite people from public works generally to come to this committee before they go to the built environment subcommittee. Okay. So, you know, if we if we're consistent with our practice, then I think we should give those folks a chance to come and speak to the subcommittee first, and then come to the big table afterwards. Okay, Tim. Uh, the minutes from the transportation subcommittee states we have here that members order that the new director of transit, David Dixon, be invited to attend the next meeting. For the subcommittee or for this is in the subcommittee. Well, apparently he is. The same direction here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But apparently he's coming to this committee as well. Okay. So unless um, Terry is about to amend her motion, we should proceed with the motion and see if it's carried as it is. Or maybe then if it's not, we'll talk about it. I think it maybe it makes more sense to have him come to uh, transportation subcommittee first. So the motion is being amended? Yeah. Okay. To invite him to come to the January Transportation Subcommittee meeting? Is that what you're thinking? Um, David Dixon's coming to the January one. Um, it might be better to have him come to a separate one. I think so we'll have a little bit more time to deal with them. So maybe February? So since it's the subcommittee part, um, I'll leave that with the subcommittee to, to figure out the logistics of um, the ATU presentation. Um, but I will reflect the motion that it be to the subcommittee and not to the main committee. Okay. okay. Yep. So we don't really have a motion now? Mm. We could just withdraw it. That would probably go easier. Okay, since it's going to subcommittee. Is yep. it okay if we withdraw it? Yep. All right. No further discussion on that. Good. So number seven, notice of motions. Are there any notices of motion? one about the forms, which we've already discussed, so it's been taken care of. Okay. Um, the only item was this possible new business. Oh, and I have a, a little update about presentations, too, for number eight. So I can, if there's no other motion. Yeah, if there's no other motions, I can move on to my number eight. Are there any other motions? Okay, number eight, and we've covered this a bit already. Uh, I was going to give you an update about the presentations coming up, and you had asked for four individuals um, to be invited, and I'll just go through. One of them was the gentleman from ATU, which we've dealt with. Uh, another was um, Mr. Dixon, the new director, and we've dealt with that. And another one was the taxi study, Al Fletcher with the taxi issue. He's either going to come in January or February. We're still working with his schedule. Um, Metrolinks will be coming in probably February to talk about uh, accessibility issues on Metrolinks. And the other one was the home caregiver parking permit issue. And I understand the subcommittee's been meeting or has met or it will be meeting with um, licensing staff whose name escapes me right now, um, to talk about this issue. And if necessary, they will come to the committee, but at this point, they still wanted to keep it at the subcommittee. Yep. And I believe we didn't because I think we were going to be today prior to this meeting, but um, 
Paula had a personal problem. So. Yeah, and Kim was had some uh, items at home she had to take care of. So that would be a possible future uh, meeting as well. So they're being worked on. We're just getting all the logistics in place. We have a motion to accept Mary's report. All presentations by, seconded by Bob. Uh, all in favor? On uh, carried. That's it? Well, if, if the, uh, Patty wanted, this was from the last um, meeting, uh, and it was to be put to a future meeting, but if time permits today, um, then the committee would like to discuss it about uh, um, Access Awareness Week. There's a small article here, and I can run and get photocopies of it, um, that has back from 1995, when uh, Geraldine Copps, uh, was demonstrating accessibility issues uh, for Hamilton Wentworth Access Awareness Week. And this would mark, Patty Murray, the 20th anniversary. In 2015, it would be the 20th anniversary if it was 1995. So, did you want to speak to this? I can run it. I'm not sure what, what, what it is. Um, is that the Urban Braille? Yeah, new yeah. sidewalks are Urban Braille. Um, yeah, that came from Mary. Yeah, from Mary, okay. Yeah. Can I, would you like copies of the the article, Maxine? I sorry, I can't read the word. Can I get you to make sure copies of that? Um, I think the committee was looking to see um, how they'd like to mark the occasion of the 20th anniversary, mm -hmm. and that was if it's something you want to discuss today or, or wait till another meeting. That's that's up to you. Well, our next meeting is in 2015. I think we should do something. Um, yeah. Has anyone spoken with her lately? Tim? Just a couple of points. First, I, I don't think 2015 is the 20th anniversary of National Access Awareness. We were being just. No, no, we're in Braille. Okay, so, so, so. You know, that underscores the point that Urban Braille's been around a lot longer than 2009. Um, uh, but as far as Geraldine is concerned, I understand that she has moved to Ottawa. That's what I am to understand. She was living at uh, Dundurn Place. Is that what the, the, the seniors place on like at Dundurn, and, Dundurn and Aberdeen? She was there, but I understand she's actually moved to Ottawa. That's my understanding. Well, and she does have children, offsprings in Hamilton. She may be able to come if that's mm -hmm. something you want to pursue. Is Nancy still, is Nancy still working? She was in mm -hmm. Geraldine's assistant. What was Nancy's last name? Do you remember? No, I'm Jackson's. Nancy Bates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's still here. Um, she's in contact with Geraldine. So anyways, that could be a connection with someone who knows where Geraldine is and how to contact. How does community want to proceed? Good. Um, I believe that uh, we need to, to do something. So that is the start with um, the invite of um, some of them that were involved 20 years ago. And Huh? You're saying I would go after Hoda Kael. Yeah, yeah. Hoda was the yeah. was the was really the um, the pathway design. Uh, yeah. Uh, last I heard, she was still on staff in, in the city of Brantford, but I don't. Well, it might be know. interesting to call her and Geraldine. Who else was involved? There's a picture of a man in the picture. In the picture, there's a man in it who was the city engineer at the time, but it That's doesn't give his name. His, his name was Vladimir Matus. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Bill Brown. I don't know where Vladimir is. Um, um, what's her name from CNIB was part of that. She works for the public board doing O and M orientation mobility. What the heck was her name? Um, 
There were five, there were five groups, right? There was transportation, housing, um, education, and recreation, recreation, and employment. It spelled the word T-H-E-R-E. -E. Mm -hmm. I know I ran the employment part of it. And I did the housing one. That's right. And who did recreation and education and transportation? Frank Lucibello at the library did recreation. And Rick Jackman was involved in some way as well. And Sandy Mumford. Brian? Um, I wonder, what, obviously we could ask the mayor's office to, to you know, officially uh, designate it and, you know, and have some kind of ceremony or something like that. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> give it some, you know, give it some, you know, headliner. You know what? I don't know if community uh, television still does interviews, but it might be interesting to have that group interviewed just to talk about what was yeah. happening in those days and what impact it had. I mean, we had a different government, too. We had a government that was very supportive of um, employment equity and things yeah. like that. Also, I mean, we have, um, like, CHCH-TV is our local station and I'm sure they'd be they you know Donna Skelly or one of those one of those personalities would be interested in maybe uh, being involved they do that type of thing other ideas Tim you were looking keen on this earlier no the, the uh, idea you talked about designation with the city they do proclamations for certain days would be a great idea to have yeah. urban real day. We even have a banner across <laughs> Main Street there. <laughs> that was one of the things Geraldine Cox painted. Really? Banners and all that type banners of thing? Banners over the street. She yeah. detested that. <laughs> I think she thought it looked Well, really everyone else gets a banner, so why not urban real, right? Well, I'm not saying no. I'm just remembering yeah. how much she disliked that. A lot of people, probably if they saw a banner, you'd go, what the heck is that? I never heard of that, right? So that'd be good to educate people. Well, it would. Yeah. Yes. I just feel um, um, ACPD should uh, do something as, as a group that has been involved from way back then, right through, and still dealing with ur urban braille. Um, whether someone do up a, a history of ACPD and, and their involvement, or just something so that um, you know, that it, it's recognized that our involvement with uh, It was a different name, though. It was, what was it? You called it FISDIS? Yeah. It was persons with physical disabilities? Yeah. What was FISDIS? It was, re it was regional. It was regional government, too. Anyways, yeah. okay, so there's some good ideas on the floor. So if someone could do, like, a history of it. Um, Mary Gallagher. Mary, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, she would. She, I wonder if she, she was. She was the secretary. Yeah, she was her. She was the community secretary. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome to get those people to talk about what happened? I'm getting nostalgic. <laughs> Where First should we go with this? Party? First committee was 1988. Was it 1988? I remember Norma Walsh called a whole bunch of community people and we had like a round table discussion what we wanted to do about National Access Awareness Week. The sad person was Wendy Kowalski. Who? Wendy, Wendy Kowalski. Kowalski. Oh, yeah. Well, she wasn't the first one. No. There was another one. Her name was George. Oh. Um, do you remember her first name? Oh, gosh. She's now. She's a she's doctor. Now. Lindsay George? Lindsay, Lindsay yes. George? Yes. Lindsay George. Yeah, she's a gerontologist. Is she? I think so. I think that's what she's she specialized in. Wasn't she after Wendy? I think she, she, she worked at the health council. Before. And then when she left, we were all so greatly disappointed and then very thrilled when we learned how dedicated and passionate Wendy was. She was, a, she was a planner with the district health council and then she went into medicine. And I think she specialized in, like that was her, one of her main interests was uh, gerontology. Actually, the Hamilton District Health Council was also involved yeah, yeah. in national access awareness. Yeah. We had quite a few meetings there. Isn't Wendy, isn't, isn't Wendy now in Burlington? Isn't she, she Halton? She is Halton, yeah. 
Public social, social services? Yeah, but she's a policy person. Should we have moved up by if I can chime in for a bit, uh, yes. Madam Chair. I, I've made note of the various uh, kind of brainstorming that was going on, and I'll include that in the minutes. And not to create more work for Cindy and Maxine, but this is kind of something now that would be carried out by, by yes. their office. Um, but uh, from the clerk's perspective, I can make note of what was initially discussed today, and then at a later time it can be pursued. Well, we, got, we got Chris Cutler for the and mayor. And Chris, yeah, yep. Chris is here too. So. <laughs> put, you, put you to work. <laughs> the committee reported to the Regional Social Services Committee, which in those days was chaired by, no, but at the political level, in those days it was chaired by David Pierce Stofferson. Mm. Before, he moved, before he moved on to provincial politics. So and now federal politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so would this so committee be involved as well? Would we have a role in it? Right yeah, yes, gonna... uh, we did actually a, a bus group with Geraldine and uh, a bunch of us went from Hamilton to um, Toronto and we were in on a lot of the, the goings on there for the ODA, the original ODA. That was a pretty which, exciting which, time. Which, yeah. was, the original ODA was spearheaded by Gary Malkowski, who I believe is still and David Malkowski. Malkowski was, was actually the, he was, he was an MPP at the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So he was the guy who was really actually spearheading the ODA before Malkowski jumped aboard. Most people don't remember this Gary Markowski was involved in that. Tim, do you remember the name of the guy that was the head of the uh, Canadian Hearing Society? Oh, oh, in those days, um, it was, uh, <laughs> no, he was, he was afterwards, but David Allen would be the guy you're thinking of. But, yep, David Allen was the director of the, of the Canadian Hearing Society. David Allen was the director of the Canadian Hearing Society for many years, but I think he, he, came, he came aboard afterwards. But Gary Malkowski was the, was the guy who was really spearheading this. Gary Malkowski was the guy who was actually really spearheading this as the MPP. He was, a, he was an MPP for one of the Toronto districts. In the provincial legislature, Gary Malkowski was the was the legislative uh, or the parliamentary assistant to whoever it was that was that was in charge of disability services, the disability portfolio under Bob Ray. But Malkowski, but Malkowski was um, was the MPP. Was he deaf or he is deaf? And yeah. Actually, Gary was born and raised in Hamilton. Oh, I'm pretty sure he's still employed by Canadian Hearing Society, at least the last I heard. So, Lori, do we need a kind of a motion for this, or how do you see this going? Um, you could do it that way, or if Cindy or Maxine just want to take it as kind of informal direction to work on setting something and then up. And then work with Chris in the mayor's office. And yeah, you yeah. can pass a motion, whatever, whatever you like, or however they'd like the direction. Maxine, Lori, would you like to make a motion? Me, so, me, me make a motion? No, <laughs> you speak to the issue. Oh, speak to it. Sure. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure what the motion is, but I'm guessing it's that we're going to have, uh, we're looking at having a celebration of some sort. Yeah. Okay. And you would like me to say that we would be help, glad to help <laughs> in whatever way we can, and that there must be a subcommittee of this committee interested in working with us. So I'm guessing that happened already and I'm just going to support that. Absolutely. We have it for the subcommittee yet, but that's a good idea. Okay, good. There we go. So would you, would you, would you committee wish to form a subcommittee to work with Maxine and good question. Listen to me? That might be a good idea. Yeah. Who all is interested? Okay. So far I see Tim, Patty, Mary, Terry, Chris, whoops, Chris, whoops. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Tim? I can provide information, but I don't have time to do that. Okay. And I could be involved. Okay. Just 
make sure I have the wording uh, correct. Now, the, the article was talking about Hamilton Wentworth Access Awareness Week, but it also mentions urban braille. So mm -hmm. is it kind of both tied together, I guess, or? We, we don't have to have the name formalized today, but just. I think um, that should be part of the discussion. OK, what it actually involves. Yeah. I've lost contact with the office, National Office for Access Awareness Week, but I know it's still happening in other communities, so that maybe we need to get in touch with them. And I don't know whether Tracy Walters or Michael Horn are still the staff members in Ottawa. Maxine, is there anything you to find out? Oh, sure. Absolutely. There's the, the, I don't know that there's a national committee, but I know that meant that it's still um, um, celebrated in a lot of municipalities in, um, and other, not just municipalities, universities, colleges, a lot of, there's a lot of organizations that do things. So I would suggest that at the committee level, we work that out and bring it back here with a plan um, of how we're gonna do that. So we'll, f we'll find out when it is. If, if the idea is to coincide it, we'll find out when that is. One of them is in June and one is in December. I just don't know which, it is, which is which. We always did ours in June. It was always the last week in May and the first week in June. It's written down May 30th, 2015. Yep. On the article. Mm -hmm. And it was nationally on that date. Mm -hmm. Yes, presumably that was transportation day. <laughs> so we do not need your motion. Who will pull the subcommittee together? Okay. Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I How do you look at Maxine, right? <laughs> I could have been looking at Chris. Yeah, yeah. That's good? Yes. Yeah, it yeah, will be done. Anything else to discuss? Yes, Bob. I was wondering, uh, either here or some uh, transportation, the situation that's coming up now is about the U Uber cabs. Look, we, how many years we try to get rid of these cab cabs now that we're going to bring them back again? I'm sorry, which cabs? Uber cabs. What's that? What's what's that? I don't know it's what been, that it's word It's been is. in the paper lately. Oh, is that delivery system? Well, a local cabbie's not happy with it anyway. Uber Cabs is something, it's, a, it's an, an app for your phone, phone yeah. and in, in the States in particular, it's got to the point where it's actually dominating the cab industry, so in large German cities, more people are using Uber Cab, and, and all that is, is if you volunteer to, to be a driver, you can be anybody, yeah. um, it shows you, you can use your app on the phone and these people will show up and completely bypasses the cab system. Completely bypassed. Wow. So they're not insured like oh, cabs geez. here. Or, you know, there's wow. The real concern. It's a risk. Is it the real right? concern for us, for is Uber cabs, is that we drag the cab companies kicking and screaming. To be licensed. To, yeah. Well, to, to, to yeah. give accessible cabs. Mm -hmm. uh, and which we finally have in place in the city. And I mean, I don't know, but I would presume that Uber cabs or Uber mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. Well, Councillor Morello is bringing this up with more. Yeah. Cities are, Toronto is, is fighting it, and it sounds like Hamilton is trying to understand what's going to happen if it arrives here. But uh, well, it's taken over the cab industry in the United States. The really. cabbies here, it's costing them big bucks now, and these guys are coming in for nothing. But is it legal? Like, does it fit within the Hamilton bylaws? Do we know? They're not licensed, so They're they can't licensed. be legal. Mm -hmm. okay, so it kind of operates on a really gray area. Yeah, There's a lot of municipalities mm -hmm. are trying to sort out what to do with them. So. I, I, I'd suggest we just simply start discussion at the transportation side. The problem is it's not an industry. It's just simply a mechanism by which people can contact somebody to, to transport them. So, and that's the that's the loose end at the political level and at the bureaucratic level. So, mm -hmm. I I'd start at the transportation subcommittee. Okay. So we we'll forward that to uh, to the agenda. Any other discussions? 
Um, it's maybe something, I don't know um, what department it would fall under, but um, just to experience, um, I had to go, I, I had to go get my um, uh, wheelchair permit, I lost it, it blew out the window, so I had to go get another temporary, mm -hmm. and um, I was at the CAA in uh, Stony Creek, and the lineup was like an hour long. And for me to stand in one spot like that, there, there was no, you had no choice. You had to stand in that line. And I was like, racks of pain. So finally I just talked to um, an, um, the person behind me. I said, I'm gonna go stand up against the wall. Just know that I'm in front of you. Like, you know, I'll step up as we, you know. And he said, oh, that was okay and everything, but, um, I think that's an issue that should be looked at for anyone with a disability, like uh, seniors or, or myself. Like standing in those lineups is is awful. And um, I remember years ago, I I mentioned it uh, before, and they said it was a, a provincial issue or whatever how they're set up and how they're managed and operating. And, but when I was in the CAA, there's a sign that it is like owned and operated by CAA, but it's, you know, Department or Ontario Works, right? Ontario Services. So I'm just wondering if it's something that uh, could be looked at in the future. You know, like something, there should be something like where you can take a number or at least someone have the courtesy to come and greet someone that you know, showing any distress in line and say, you know, come and sit over here or do something. Like, it, it's pretty bad. That's right, yeah. Well, I was just saying, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it'd be a, it sounds like it would be a simple solution. I, you know, a lot of places just yeah, but you come in, you take a number, right? And they call you a number. So it sounds like it's a pretty... If it was brought to their attention, would they look at it or something? Numbers present problems to people like me. Yeah. I can't take a number. You draw a number. Oh, who's that right? Yeah, yeah. I can't. Well, my hands don't work. Yeah, yeah. So, go ahead, Maxine. Oh, uh, actually, I, I, I missed the very beginning. Is this a provincial office? Ontario, where, wherever oh. you go to get your driver's license. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Services. All right, it's so any yeah. business. But it's CAA. Um, yeah. Operating. I can give you a phone number uh, where you can call that in uh, at the province. Because, yeah, there is a requirement. I mean, the next time you could just say to them, so, you know, what accommodation are they, you, they, you have in place for someone who can't wait in line. They're supposed to have that. But you, there's a phone number as well you can call. Okay, and um, I was told um, later, like, you know, because I, I, I was rode off for the day after yeah. standing in line. Yeah. You know, that was, that was the end of my day. But um, um, I was watching uh, uh, some guys just not even getting in line and going down to one teller. And I said, what's going on there? And it's uh, dealers. Dealers don't have to stand in yeah. line. That's and separate. I'm like... It's a separate thing. They're doing something completely different. No, because when there's no dealer, they'll take someone from the line. Yeah. But so they can still help yeah. you. But numbers would work. Yeah. I mean, like as and if I can't reach the numbers in most doctor's offices either, but you can ask somebody to give you one. Wouldn't well, it well, also be a problem for somebody who's visually impaired? Yeah. Yes. Number well, number the number is big enough that most people could see it, but they call it out and they flash it on a... Yeah. Um, a good sized screen so that you have both a vocal and a visual call does it, if you know what your number is. Does anybody have an issue in city offices? Because that's what we're dealing with here as the city yeah. family. I understand it's an issue. That's provincial patty. And it's, but it's, it's not. I, I, I it's run by but CAA. It's, I, it doesn't I, matter. It's, it's not. We, we, we're here to work on city issues, Patty. I know I, I, I feel for you. 
Yeah. Does anybody have a complaint about what's happening at City Hall when you come for service? <laughs> we know we have to stand in line for that. I, I understand, but that's 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 our that's our purview. Yeah. Not what's happening at Service Ontario. Yeah. In the past, though, we have asked the councillors to make a motion or take information to the province. Mm -hmm. So we might be able to do that. Okay. I'm not exactly sure. Go ahead, Tim. I'm going to make two points. First off, Chris is here on behalf of the mayor. I'm sure he can take that message to the mayor. And if the mayor is, is able to um, address that in his communications, with uh, provincial representatives, then maybe that can be done, and maybe Chris can report back here. That's sure. okay. Yeah. Um, secondly, I just I, I, I apologize, but I can't stay. I just wanted to wish everybody the absolute best for the for the holiday season, the New Year's, and all of that. And I wish everybody happiness, health, safe safe travels wherever you may be going, and uh, all the best for uh, the New Year. And we'll see you in January. Thank you. And you're off to Hawaii. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. Hawaii at 47. Tim had a Thank suggestion. You. Did you, Patty, what did you want to do with it? Did you want a motion or are you happy with Tim's suggestion? I have the door open for you. Okay. Take whatever, whatever will work. Like, yeah. I just think it's so an issue. If, not only, not only, uh, Service Ontario, but I'm sure there's other, you know, there should be some kind of um, customer service, um, something in the works for anyone that has to stand in the lineup like that. And I don't know how high in the mayor's list of things to do this might be. So, well, I, I can look into it, Madam Chair. If you okay. Have to follow and would up. you report back to us if we should do something else? Absolutely. All right. Use your crutch as a weapon. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Yeah, Happy, happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. But have a great year, and I, I echo what Tim said. Be safe and healthy and warm and happy. Yeah. Motion future. Yeah. Yeah. Terry, Tim. Well, that's great. Favor. Mm -hmm.